All right, well, I'll get started. Are there any questions about anything here? Any questions about the homework? Or <clears throat> Well, see here, I probably should do a, uh, another related rate problem here, and then we'll go on. So, um, uh, related rates problems, uh, pretty much they're all cut from the same cloth. Essentially, you have some word problem. You have some variables involved, and you can naturally con consider the variables to be functions of time. Then because we know calculus, we can differentiate the equation which relates the variables, and then that will relate the rates. It's pretty much that. Every single example is kind of like that. Um, so here's one that's a pretty popular uh, example. We had a ladder, and we had a wall, and a ladder against the wall, it's sliding, all right? Suppose the length of the ladder is, say, 10 feet, all right? And you're given that the ladder is sliding down at a rate of 2 feet per second at a particular instant in time, all right? And, and the, it's sliding, the uh, top of the ladder sliding down the, the wall at a rate of 2 feet per second when this is, let's say, at... Um, oh, I don't know, six feet, all right? So then the question is, how fast does base of ladder slide at this instant? Right? So that's the problem. So I did the problem statement here, right there. All right, so um, when you're faced with a problem like this, uh, sort of the first thing you want to do is to maybe draw the picture again and try to make some labels for the things that are involved. All right? So in this one, I have to say, okay, well, this is 10. I'm going to work in feet, so I'm not going to put 10 feet now, right? Uh, I'm going to call the distance this way x. I'm going to call the distance this way y, right? So basically then with that nomenclature, with that labeling, um, I can then say, okay, so what I'm after is dx dt. I'm after the rate of change of x, right? The question then becomes what is dx dt, right? because that's the instantaneous rate of change of x with respect to time, right? What are we given? Right, so what's that make dy dt equal to what? Two, yeah, two feet per second. Well, y is y is equal to six, right? So, I mean, fine, I can put in feet per second here. We're, you know, we're going to work in feet in seconds. So, uh, but that's not actually right. Because y is decreasing. So that means dy dt is minus 2, minus 2. Right. So a little tricky, but that's that. Um, and, well, we know what, I mean, we also know that this is a right triangle, right? So what does that mean? 90 degrees. What, what theorem applies? 
Yeah, the, the, I heard Pythagorean theorem. Oh, you say x squared, x squared plus y squared is equal to 100 squared, I mean 10 squared, which is 100, right? So that makes x equal to the square root of 100 minus y squared, which in this case is 136, which is the square root of 64, which is 8, right? So x is equal to 8 at the time we're interested in, right? So what is 36 minus 6? 6 squared? See, y. We, yeah, y is 6, right? All right. So what's dx dt? I mean, we, we know x, we know y, we know dy dt is minus 2, right? We also know this is the relation between x and y, right? And this is true for all t um, close to the time, close to the time of interest, right? Like that model, that models the motion of the ladder falling, not just at the instant we're interested in, but in all times close, close to it, right? And that makes it logically reasonable to differentiate that equation and to think of x and t as functions of time. So that's what we'll do. Differentiate, I'll call it star, with respect to time, what do you get? I'll do it down here. So ddt of x squared plus y squared is 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt. And what's that equal to? What's x squared plus y squared equal to? Well, x squared plus y squared is equal to 100, right? So this is equal to the time derivative of 100. What's the time derivative of 100? What's the derivative of a constant? It's 0, right? So this is 0. So you can divide by 2, right? And this equation gives us the dx dt is equal to minus y and dy dt divided by x. But notice that we know y, we know dy dt, and we know x. We've already calculated all of those. So we can put those in and figure out what dx dt is. It is, what was it? Minus y was, oh, y was 6, right? So I've got minus 6 times minus 2 divided by, what was x? Well, we forget, 8, right? So we got 12, 12 over 8, which is what? 1.5? So therefore, the answer is that dx dt, 1.5, and I always try to put units on my answer, feet per second. And the reason I know it's feet per second is because I've been working all of the calculation in feet and seconds, right? Three halves? I mean, you could also say it's three halves. Is it three halves? Four times three divided by two times four, right? Fours cancel, three over, three over two. Like three halves feet per second, also a legitimate answer, right? Although I think in your physics course, if you give your answers three halves, they'll be annoyed. You know? <laughs> like in, phys in science classes, we tend to like to have decimal answers or perhaps uh, scientific notation answers better yet, right? I am not even discussing significant figures in this class, for the record, <laughs> okay? We just assume all numbers are perfectly known and we try to give answers which are, um, you know, ac like exact. And as just a point of, um, as, as a point of convenience, if the answer is really ugly involving like many, many square roots and stuff like that, then I'm always open to like leaving the answer as like a decimal with four places or something like that. 
four, four, four numbers typically works. Because here, the um, point of this course really isn't so much numerical work, it's coming to a conceptual understanding of calculus. That's really what we're after in here. And building algebra skills, I hope. Any questions about this? All right. So I'll just make a, a remark. Right. If you have a ladder, right, and you had a wall at angle theta, right, and you had a ladder kind of like sliding down the wall like that, how would that be different? If I called, if I called this distance x, and I called this distance over here. Why, right? Yes. Yeah, the, the formula definitely. I suppose it's still 10, right? Then there's something called the law of cosines, right? And the law of cosines on this triangle, well, it's like generally speaking, if you have a triangle that's like, got to be careful, this is theta, this is A, this is B, this is C. Law of cosines says C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared minus twice AB cosine of, let me call that gamma, gamma. So part of the annoyance here is I have the, I need the angle in here to do law of cosines, right? So if that's theta, how do I get the angle here? Yeah, 180 minus theta, very good. And so with that, then I could say, okay, so my C is 10, so I've got 100 is equal to x squared plus y squared minus 2xy cosine of 180 minus theta. Now here theta is, I mean you could, you, you could in principle work a problem where you had a, a wall where the, the, the angle of the wall was changing in time. And you could even account for that by differentiating theta as a function of time. But if theta is fixed, it's just a number. Like you have a problem where theta is 80 degrees in the homework. So I'm, I'm helping you with your homework at the moment. But yeah, mission six. Yeah. Oh, by the way, just can you tell me how to simplify that? If you didn't want to work with cosine 180 minus theta, you could also do what? That's cosine 180 cosine minus theta minus sine 180 sine minus theta. So that's zero. And cosine 180 is minus one. So actually, this you could replace this whole thing with minus the cosine of theta. In other words, you could look at the equation 100 equals to x squared plus y squared plus 2xy cosine theta if you don't want to work with the shifted angle. Which is kind of funny, but there it is. All right, enough about that. I'll work one more, one more related rates problem here and then we're going to go on, okay? And um, so this one. So here's the, here's the question. So imagine yourself, you're at a, you're like a fairground or something, right? And um, you're over here. And somebody else got a hot air balloon. Right. I 
sad picture of a hot air balloon. Um, and that hot air balloon is, let's say, you know, 500 feet from you, right? And suppose that the hot air balloon is 100 feet up, right? And let's suppose that it's also such that it's, it's going upward at a rate of 10 feet per second. All right. Then the question is this, what's the angle of elevation? What's the rate of change of the angle of elevation in the balloon given this scenario? Yeah, well, how is the rate, what's the rate of change of the angle of inclination? So what, what do we mean by angle of inclination? The rate that it's going up. What does this term angle of inclination mean? Yeah, it's like the angle for an inclined plane. If you could imagine a hypothetical inclined plane that would ramp you up to the balloon, it would be the angle of that inclined plane. You could think of it that way, sure. So if we, we're, we're going to neglect the, the height of the man, all right, or woman, or whatever, let's see here. Pick your, that was supposed to be a straight line. Um, <laughs> it's close. And so the angle of inclination is this guy, all right? So the question then is, what is our actual question? Our question is, what is d theta dt at this instant? So to solve this problem, we need to find some kind of relation between the angle and right, the, uh, the variables at play here. So I'm going to draw the triangle again. Well, yeah, I'm, this is the vertical height. And so we're neglecting curvature of the Earth. Although, for the record, I, I do think that the Earth is curved. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Um, well, anyway, hopefully that's not controversial. Okay, so here is x, here's y, here's theta. How are they related? Ooh, side side angle is not going to help us here. We, we, see, we, we want to go with analytic geometry because analytic geometry gives us an equation and equations we can differentiate. It is a right triangle. Yeah, well, I mean, it is true. You could also ask the question if this is S. How is the distance increasing at that instant? That's another question you could ask. That's not the one I asked, though. If I wanted to do that, I'd look at x squared plus y squared equals to s squared, differentiate it. Um, dx dt here is 0, right, because the balloon's going straight up. Actually, that might be worth doing for a second here. What's dx dt? dx dt is 0 by assumption. dy dt? That's a 10, 10 feet per second. We're going to work in feet and seconds, right? Oh, it does matter. I mean, x is equal to 500 at the point we're interested in, the time we're interested in. y is equal to 100 at the time we're interested in. Also true. I mean, these are things that we're given. But we need a relation between x, y, and theta. What is that relation from trigonometry? Cosine? That's going to involve s. We don't really care about s. We know x, we know y. We're interested in theta. How are these related? 
Yeah, you need the one, they need the, the trigonometric function that involves opposite and adjacent, right? So that's, wait. <laughs> But I vaguely remember this. Yeah. Just uh, 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 it was tangent. Okay. Don't, don't count tangent out. Tangent theta. <laughs> tangent theta oh. is y over x. There we go. That's what we need. That's the relation between theta, y, and x. Right? And now here, theta, y, and x are all functions of time. So this equation, when we differentiate it, will relate the rates. Differentiate tangent, what do you got? We got ourselves a secant squared theta, but chain rule says d theta dt multiplied by d theta dt, right? The derivative of y over x is what? That's a quotient, right? Quotient rule, that's right. So that's going to be... Um, x times dy dt minus y times dx dt divided by x squared. So, great. Um, now, what is, what is secant theta here equal to? I mean, so this, this gives us that d theta dt equal to, you know, x dy dt minus y dx dt all over secant squared theta. We know everything there except for what? Secant theta, right? I mean, this, this equation is going to be true for many other times. But it's also true at the time we're interested in, which is when the 500 feet and the 100 feet is given. So now there's different ways to approach this. One way would be to use like inverse tangent to actually find the angle. And then you could plug the angle into the secant function on your calculator if you have one. But a, an easier way to do this is to just look at a triangle and figure out what secant is in terms of, you know, hypotenuse and adjacent and such. So I'll do it that way. Um, so the, I'm, I'm, I've got theta, right? The x is 500. The opposite side is 100. The hypotenuse is the square root of you know, 100 squared plus 500 squared, right? So that makes secant theta equal to what? I mean, I guess I can rewrite this. This is really what? It's also cosine squared theta times that. I mean, anyway, I'll just put the numbers in. So, I have 500 dy dt. Now, was I right? Is that positive? Check me on that. Does that make sense? It's going up, right? So, if, if the wording on this problem was a little bit different, right? Yeah, if the balloon was coming down, be careful. That would give us a negative dy dt. Watch out for that in these problems. Now, dx dt was zero because we're assuming the balloon's vertical, right? You could change this problem so that the balloon was like, uh, you know, well, let's not do that. <laughs> zero. There we go. Uh, so 500 times 10 divided by secant squared, which is what? Secant squared is hypotenuse. So secant squared is hypotenuse squared over adjacent squared, right? So hypotenuse squared is 100 squared plus 500 squared. divided by adjacent squared, which in this case is 500 squared. So whatever that is, 500 cubed times 10 divided by, um, you know, 100 squared plus 500 squared. And I'm, I'm going to resist the strong temptation I have to work that out without a calculator and just get my calculator. I mean, you could do that without a calculator if you really wanted to. What'd you get? Four 
Something feels very wrong about that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying you miscalculate. I'm saying I'm wondering if I have a conceptual error in here somewhere. I got to think about it. Yeah, I got the same. That does not feel right. That is that is that is absurd. That is just absurd. I mean, the, the rate, this is in radians too, by the way, guys. So like calculus, remember our basic relation for sine, we, we have that, we, we draw a unit circle and remember the, the unit circle argument led to the derivative, like the limits of sine and cosine, the sine, you know, sine h over h limits to one. That is based on radian measure. So th this is in radians per second. Well, radians, oh, radians per second? Yeah, radians per second. Man, that is, that is way too big. No, no, that, that's, that's a crazy number. That is not right. So there is an error in something here. And I, I don't think, I mean, 10 feet per second, that's not too big. Five hundred feet, one hundred feet. That doesn't seem seems somewhat reasonable. Oh, I see what I missed. I see what I missed, guys. I missed something. You guys, come on, guys. You got to work alongside me as I do these problems, right? This right here is gone when we did the algebra step. Where'd it go? It's supposed to be here. That gives us an extra divide by 500. <laughs> so does that matter? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, 500 squared. Let's take your 4807.69 and divide by 500 squared. What do we get? 1 over 52. <laughs> so 0 0.01923 radians per second. I am much happier with that answer. And if we convert that degree, how many degrees per second is that? How many radians is a degree? I will remind you. 180 degrees equals pi radians. So I have to multiply by 180 over pi to change from, from radians per second to degrees per second. Which I think is like multiplying by 57. What you get? One point. Okay, I assume, actually, yeah, I assume you just did a calculator. Okay. okay, so, but, <laughs> fair enough. So, 1.10, one. yeah, 1.8, yeah. So, 1.102 um, degrees per second, let's say. Which I, I think is a very reasonable, just kind of like eyeballing the problem. That kind of makes sense kind of see it. One degree up. If it's, you'd be able to see that, right? That would be discernible motion. Right. Now, the other thing 
but you can turn this problem around, right? The, way more, the sort of more interesting way to ask this question is to say, okay, you're observing a balloon go up at a point away from you. You know it's going vertically. You know the distance from you to where the balloon's going up is, is some fixed number, maybe it's a mile, right? And you also, um, you know, you can judge the height of the balloon by some other method, right? Um, then if you, could, if you could actually see the, if you could measure the rate of change of the angle going up, then you could also measure the, measure the speed going up. I mean, anyway, there's a relation between the rate of change of the angle of the inclination, the, the rate at which it's, it's rising, and, and this trigonometric relation. So, so calculus um, gives us another, um, you know, avenue for investigating word problems, namely we can relate rates of change. And this is the method of related rates. So that's pretty much all I have to say about that. I think the homework that you have should help round this discussion out, and I hope you enjoy it. I've given you some pretty significant hints about the homework this time. I think there's, um, there's, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I've covered everything that's in the homework and lecture, but it's a, it's a pretty good, pretty good push. I do think there's a problem in the homework where you need to use um, distance as rate times time, but I think we did that last time, so. All right. So moving on. We've already dealt with chapter five in my notes in lab um, when we talked about Newton's method, all right? So we're actually going on to chapter six. And chapter six is essentially on graphing with calculus. But in chapter six, we discover, learn, um, are introduced to whatever you want to say, uh, the major theorems of differential calculus. And the major theorems of differential calculus there are, there are a few, but um, the first we should talk about is, I believe, Fermat's theorem. But before we can do that, we need to just give a quick definition. All right. So we're interested in studying maximums and minimums. All right, so, so things we're going to learn about here is um, maximums, minimums, um, intervals of increase, intervals of decrease, intervals of concave up, concave down. Uh, we'll learn the first and second derivative tests, and hopefully today we'll cover the mean value theorem. All right, but first of all, um, just a definition. So we say um, F has local maximum, I can't spell, local max at, uh, let's say, X equals to C if F of X is less than or equal to F of C for all x near c, all right, in domain of f. That's a local maximum, all right? And what would a local minimum be? Local minimum would be um, Say f of c is local minimum at x equals to c if f of x is greater than or equal to f of c for all x near c. Now, it, it doesn't have to be for all x everywhere. It just has to be for x near the point, right? This is a local minimum or a local maximum, right? And collectively, both of these together, we call local extrema, right? So if I ask you, find the local extrema for a function, I'm saying find all local maximums and minimums for the function. 
Now we also talk about global maximums and global minimums, right? So a global or absolute max min is same about same as above, except instead of near. We um, demand, you know, f of x greater than or equal to f of c for all x in the domain of f, or f of x less than or equal to f of c for all x in the domain of f. So the first one I wrote this would make f of c the absolute minimum, right? For all. For all. For all, yeah. And I also use this one, there exists. Right. So this is the absolute minimum. This is the absolute maximum. All right. So example So here's y equals absolute value of x uh, minus 2 plus 1. Right. If I say this thing is, if this is my function, f of x, all right, we can see from graphing that this function has an absolute minimum of what? So there's two things going on. The value which y takes on is the absolute minimum, and then there's also the question of what, what the question, there's two questions. What is the absolute minimum versus where does it happen? When I talk about where it happens, I'm talking about x. When I'm talking about what it is, I'm talking about y. So where it happens is at 2, right? And what is f of 2? Minimum. 1, right? So this is the absolute minimum, or that you could say the global minimum for that function. Is there a global maximum? Well, no. And um, is that a local minimum? Is, you know, is, is, two, is f of 2 a local minimum for f? Yes, it is, right? Because if it's, if it's true for all points, it's certainly true for points near the point, right? So every global maximum or every global minimum is also a corresponding local max or min, but the converse need not be true, right? You can have a, you can have a local minimum a local maximum, which is not a global one, like here. Suppose we had a function that looked like this. All right. So I would point out local maximums here and here, right? Local max, local max. Right? Local min, right here. Right, local min's here and here. Yeah. Oh. Uh-huh. Yeah, if it was like a V, then it would be a maximum, right? Yeah, I, I think I know what you mean. Here, I'll give you an uh, example three. I'm going to look at f of x equal to three minus the absolute value of x plus two. The graph of that, it takes the absolute value function, it flips it over, it shifts it up three, 
it's basically here. I it should go through it should go through one. So yeah, there. After my So yeah, you could have that as well. Now, for Ma's theorem, it says the following. It says that, um, if I could find it, Where is my, oh, there it is. Oh, I've neglected, I'm sorry, I, I've, I'm getting ahead of the story. There's one other theorem I must share with you, but this is a theorem that I cannot prove. <laughs> the, the, the proof of this theorem is a little bit outside the scope of a course, but um, theorem, this is the extreme value theorem. All right, what the extreme value theorem says is simply this. If f is continuous on a closed interval from a to b, then f attains um, absolute minimum and maximum on that interval. In other words, if you have a continuous function and you look at the values that it takes on from A to B, there has to be a largest one and there has to be a smallest one. You're like, well, of course that's true, right? But the proof of that is actually somewhat technical. So, all right. I mean, I can draw a picture, say, here's my proof, right? <laughs> here's A, here's B. If, if it's continuous, well, then I know I can graph something like this, right? I mean, I don't know. We can't do that. i got to pass the vertical line test, right? My, my graph is not very good at the moment. But, uh, I mean, it could do all kinds of crazy stuff, right? But it's continuous, so that means it has to have, a, like, a highest point, right? It has to have, like, a lowest point. And so that's my max. If I'm in, and it could be it could be that there's multiple points where you reach the max or min, right? But there has to at least exist a max and min value. Okay, extreme value theorem. For Ma's theorem. says this, it says that if f has a local extreme value of f of c, f of c, right, and prime of C exists, then F prime of C is equal to zero. So this is for Ma's theorem. And um, I'm actually not going to prove it because I, I think it's already, you can already see it, right? In the examples that we have, I mean, if you think about what, is it, what does it mean if you think about a graph to have a local extreme, ex 
extreme value, right? You're either at the top of a hill, bottom of a valley. In both of those cases, if if it's smooth, right, then what is what does the tangent line look at the top look like at the top of the hill or the bottom of the valley? It's it's yeah, it's, well, they're always a line, right? But um, it's is what kind of line? It's a it's a horizontal line, right? Oh, that's a what? Oh, horizontal, yeah. Ah. So slope zero, right? Which means that the derivative at such points is zero. All right? Now, Fermat's theorem doesn't directly say anything about points where the derivative doesn't exist, right? But if you go back and you look at our, our examples, right? What did we see? What, what did we see about those other points where we had local max and min? That we were, you, you made me draw the V1 upside down, remember? If we look at our example one, so we had local minimum. The derivative doesn't exist at this point, right? Derivative zero, derivative zero, derivative zero, derivative zero. Here's the local max. The derivative doesn't exist at this point. So apparently, we're interested in points for the function where either the derivative is zero or what? Or it doesn't exist. And so for that reason, we give the following definition. If f is function for which either f prime of c equals to 0 or f prime of c does not exist uh, as a function for which, I, I should say c is in the domain of f. c has to be a point in the domain, okay? And, and either, sorry, I added the word c in the domain of f, and either f of prime of c is equal to 0 or f prime of c does not exist, then c is called a critical number. Sometimes people, you'll hear people say, Fermat's theorem says what? So what's Fermat's theorem imply? Implies F has local max min at critical numbers. anywhere. Actually, I don't like that sentence. Let me rewrite it. Fermat's theorem says this. It says that if f has local max min, max or min, then they must be found at critical points. And so what's a critical point? A critical point is a point in the graph of the function where you're at a critical number. I'm just, I'm saying critical number refers to the x. Critical point is the pair x comma c comma f of c. C is a critical number. C comma f of c is a critical point. Now, in practice, I try very hard not to penalize students for confusing critical number with critical point, but I would like to make the distinction myself. You know? Uh, so that's, that's Fermat's theorem. Now, so that, that's extremely, so the, the proof is given on page 204, by the way, and it, 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 it involves using um, like squeeze theorem arguments and uh, 
you know, definition of the derivative essentially. So that brings us to um, the first theorem, which I, I will try to at least sketch the proof of, which is Rolle's theorem. Now, <clears throat> this is like a very big idea. This basically gives us insight. This is we're going to use this this notion of Fermat's theorem to look for like local maxes and mins. What we got to do is we calculate the derivative, we set it equal to zero. That's going to tell us where, min, where, where mins and maxes happen. Before I go on to Rolle's theorem, let me just get, show you an example of that. Because there's a simple example we could give that maybe you've seen before. Find local um, extrema. f of x equal to ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are constants. Yeah. So this is a polynomial, right? So the critical numbers have to be places where the derivative is 0. So what's, what's df dx here? So we have 2ax plus b. So we're looking for critical numbers. We set that equal to 0. What's that tell me? x equals 2 minus b over 2a. That is the only critical number for this quadratic polynomial. I think I told you guys earlier when we were reviewing some pre-calculus a little bit that that was the x-coordinate for the vertex of the parabola, right? So, I mean, from an algebra perspective, you could complete the square on the on the quadratic polynomial, and when you do, you'll get this in the completed square. I mean, there's completing the square. This shows you the vertex at um, you know h equal to b over two a. Yeah. Excuse me, minus b over two a. Oh man. Oh, there's no plus here. That, there's no minus here. That's supposed to be a plus. I do this sometimes. So vertex is at minus b over 2a. And of course, that's not, I mean, this is the algebra way, calculus way, just set the derivative equal to 0. That shows you that this is the place where you have 0 slope, which of course is your vertex. Calculus is easier than that, for sure, right? Yeah. OK. Rolle's theorem. What does Rolle's theorem tell us? That was an application of Fermat's theorem, yeah. Because Fermat's theorem guides us. It tells us that if there's going to be a local max or min, it has to happen where a derivative is zero, right? So to find the local maximum or minimum, I just calculate the derivative, set it equal to zero. In this case, there's only one possibility, that x equal to minus b over 2a. But then I think about my life and realize, oh, this is, a, this is a parabola. And that makes sense. We just found that the vertex is the only local max. And whether it's a max or a minimum 
depends on whether A is positive or negative, right? So what's Rolle's theorem? State it for you. So there's a few theorems that like every student of calculus are supposed to know, like coming out of calculus one, this is one of them. You should know Rolle's theorem. Um, you should know the extreme value theorem. You should know the intermediate value theorem. Um, and of course you should know the mean value theorem, which we'll get to shortly. But let's, this, this one's a new one, Rolle's theorem. So here it is. Suppose um, f is a function. such that number one, f is continuous on a, b. Number two, f is differentiable on the open interval from a to b. And three, f of a is equal to f of b, right? Then there exists c in the open interval from a to b such that f prime of c equals to zero. This is Rolle's theorem. Right. So, I mean, if I just give you a heuristic, this is not a proof, right? But proof by picture here is kind of stupid if you allow that method of proof. I mean, we have A, we've got B, right? And what else do you know? F of A is equal to F of B, so let's suppose that's here, right? And the function is what? It's continuous on the closed interval. That means you can graph it um, without lifting the chalk, right? So whatever. And then so it's, it, this says that there exists a c such that f prime of c is equal to 0. Well, yeah, of course, right? At least one, maybe more. Right, this is Rolle's theorem. Sometimes I tell students that if you think about it in terms of physics, it's helpful. It's basically like, you know, if you have a piece of chalk, right, and you throw it. No! Oh, phew. That's expensive chalk if it breaks. So it was supposed to end in my hand. So start, start and stop at the same point. So y of a equals to y of b if I'm thinking of x being time. The initial and final position of the chalk are the same. That means at some point there has to be a place where it had zero y velocity. What comes up must come down. Yeah. So that, that's what Rolle's I say you could think of Rolle's theorem as saying what comes what goes up must come down. <laughs> um, well, excuse me. What? <laughs> that's not what it says. It says that somewhere, if something begins and ends at the same point, there was a place where it, it stopped going or coming. That's right, if you roll a ball up a hill and it comes back to you, there was some point where that ball stopped rolling. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's the proof. I think it's good for you guys to see some proofs in here. It's one of those. And so here's the proof. If f of x is just equal to k for all x in a, b, right? Then, <laughs> then f prime of x is equal to zero, so for all x. So we're done, okay? So great. But, I mean, that would be the stupid case if the function was just like this, you know? But, 